Hey, thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about ION. Um, this is the centralized identifier network that we, we built, uh, collaborated with others to build, actually, um, not at Microsoft, at Decentralized Identity Foundation, but we were major contributors. Um, I'll, let's dig in. So understanding the problem, first thing to understand about decentralized identifiers is like, what's the actual issue that they're trying to solve? You know, we don't just want technology for technology's sake. Um, two types of identity data will help sort of focus on the issue of decentralized identifiers. There's your identity data, which is all the stuff about you, right? Like your, you know, credentials, your tweets, your blog posts, your photos, all that stuff's identity data. Um, describes you in some way, it's some, some an expression of yourself. And then you have identifiers, which are the actual references to your identities. And you might have multiple sort of facets of your identity, like personas, as it were. And those identifiers today are typically email addresses, usernames, those sorts of things. Um, and they're owned by, by companies. So there's some issues with that, right? The status quo of identity, um, your, your, your identifiers can be snapped out of existence, right? It like can just be dusted um, anytime a provider wants. Um, your connections go with that. So if you have you know, your, your ID severed, uh, email address or a username in an app, you know, like Twitter or something like that, all the connections and followers and all the stuff you built, um, the relationships you built over time, um, while they may not go away with the people, it can make it much harder to connect if you lose you know, that reference, because sometimes people speak over pseudonyms, which means that they might not know exactly how to contact you again. Um, and, and your content can be deleted in a keystroke. So this, you know, it's, really, it's really important that we get this right, because we're seeing this more and more in the world today, where the answer seems to be, because we've commingled uh, identity, is that we sever people. Uh, from what's increasingly becoming more important, which is your digital, um, your digital persona. Um, so this isn't hypothetical, and I know you've all seen it. Um, tons of people are getting, you know, severed from Twitter, um, which you know deletes all their contacts and everything else, and that's just really not acceptable. Um, interestingly enough, in the time since I gave this talk with this this one slide that happened to be in it that I presented before, um, I was actually suspended from Twitter for twelve hours. So. I got a little taste of it, even though I've talked about it for a long time. And I've, I've seen, you know, friends who are very much mainstream get suspended. And I'm sure you all know folks. Um, it, it's, it's a little, it's shitty to have happened to you. And you, you don't want that to be the case. And it's all because we've commingled identity with apps because we don't have a digital identity layer for the web. Um, so apps become this sort of de facto identity, um, which is, is really not how things should be. So how do we fix this? Well, we have this really cool new spec that's just about finished. It's gonna be an international standard here in a matter of months um, called W3C Decentralized Identifiers. It's, it's codified in the same body that codifies web technologies and, and browser standards, um, the kind that Dietrich and I used to work on at Mozilla. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's a robust standard. It's been worked on for many, many years, over half a decade, and finally you know, arriving. And essentially what it is, is the ability to give you identifiers that are yours, that are truly owned and controlled by you. Um, it defines a data model and a URI scheme, which you can see over there on the right of my screen. Um, the URI scheme is basically did colon, you know, like you would have HTTP colon, that's where IPFS colon, that sort of thing. Um, then you've got your method portion. The important piece there, you see ION, is that there's not just, ION isn't the only type of decentralized identifier that could adhere to the spec. There could be other constructions as well. Um, but I is one of them, and that's what that segment means. And then the other gobbledygook on the right side is the actual identifier itself. And these identifiers are backed with um, cryptographic keys, and they also can include things like routing endpoints. So it's not about identity data. That's the one big thing I want to, you know, like we talked about in the first slide, there's your identity data, there's your identifiers. ION is not a system of putting your identity data somewhere public. It is a system of identifiers. So it's how do you prove you own this string and then where, what are the routing endpoints that I could go to find data, you know, in a, you know, private data or communicate with you. So what, what's the real core like technical issue and why aren't DIDs like, why haven't they been around for a long time? Um, well, there's actually like this really, really interesting problem that's been around for 40 years, you know, ever really since the dawn of like digital identity itself um, and the CA system, which is you don't really have the ability to know what keys are related to an identifier, what certificates, you know, in the system are related to an identifier, uh, like a domain, 
um, in a decentralized way. So we've had to create these hierarchies. And the reason why is because as we see here in the example of the identifier of Theseus, there's, no, there's never been a system of record that keeps track of historical change, linear historical change um, that's decentralized and immutable. We've never had that before, right? Um, and that's, that's actually what Satoshi solved with Bitcoin was, was creating this thing. Uh, up to that point, we had CA systems that were based on hierarchies and central authorities and someone saying, well, this domain name's associated with this set of, you know, set of cryptographic material because I say so, right? And you don't have to know the history. It's just whenever I say it's different, it's different. Not a great thing for basing like human identity on because that's a human rights risk in my opinion. So what we see here in, you know, this example of Theseus is when an ID starts out, it can have one set of keys and one set of endpoints with it, right? And Theseus is this Greek hero. He left on a journey with the ship. And over the course of his journey, everything about the ship's changed. So like every nail and, and board, everything about it. So it looks, looks very different. So over the course of time, you, you know, you're rot rotating keys, you're switching out endpoints. And then, you know, far down the track, nothing about your, your DID or its lineage, its secure lineage uh, is the same, right? So we haven't had that ability to track that. So in this case, in this example, when Theseus ship comes back to the dock, if you imagine someone who saw it, saw it when it left, they would question, they would say, well, is this Theseus ship? I don't know. I can't securely understand or know because I wasn't there when every board and plank was replaced. So that's what you need for PKI. You need something that can track the backbone of key lineage and you know, what routing points are supposed to be associated at any given time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about ION and how it might solve this. Uh, it's, an open public and permissionless layer two network that runs atop Bitcoin um, provides robust decentralization, interdiction resistance, um, and scale. So we can do DIDs at scale right on top of, of Bitcoin. Um, unlike other DID protocols, it doesn't rely on any trusted validators. There's no sort of centralized authorities, not even Microsoft. We don't have any like authority in the system. It's a, a mathematical protocol, um, no additional consensus schemes and no special utility tokens. Um, we, we didn't want any of these things when we built it because we wanted it to be completely a public utility and control, controlled by users. Um, what is it at 10,000 feet? And this is where we start getting into the IPFS portion of this. Um, so if you look at this sort of layout here, you've got a couple different ion nodes. If we assume there's only two ion nodes in the world, this is kind of a, you know how it would look. Um, first ion node could batch one or multiple uh, operations, so creates of IDs, updates of keys, that sort of thing uh, together. And this could be anyone, this could be Alice at her house, this could be like Microsoft running a node, whatever. The only point of aggregation here is that, you know, some people might not want to be running Bitcoin or doing cryptocurrency transactions or paying, so you can aggregate them, people can do this for you. Um, all the transactions, the operations are signed before they leave your, your device. So if I, as Alice, wanted to have Microsoft anchor one of these uh, operations for me. It's not like they can mutate it. They can't like, you know, do anything insecure. They can't violate, you know, any part of the, the operation itself because it's cryptographically secured uh, on a device. Once those are assembled by ion node one into a batch, they're anchored into Bitcoin with an IPFS CID. So what ion node one did was it sort of assembled this file structure, um, a few different files, and then it put it together um, in, in through some linkages and anchored that in, in a CID in Bitcoin. And what all the other nodes are doing is they're all watching Bitcoin. So when they first start up, they're like going to the block number that's the starting number for ION. And they're, they're essentially reading forward and then they continue observing. And they're looking for these CID, these marked uh, transactions in Bitcoin. And when they find them, they fetch the data and then circulate it through the you know, IPFS and underlying web P2P protocols and get it and process it all the same. So it's a, it's a deterministic system. There's no agreement between the ion nodes. There's no secondary consensus. It is purely um, data and determinism. So what do the file structures look like? Um, this is a little, this is basically what, what those ion nodes do when they're creating you know, operations and, and bundling them together. Um, they are essentially creating a tree of files that serve different purposes. Um, you can see them here. I won't go into all of them, but they're all IPFS files. They're all linked together. And there's a, there's a root CID that's put into um, the blockchain. Uh, I'll note that Brave and Opera already integrated IPFS, as you probably already know, and other browsers that I can't name specifically on this call, but I know very well, are also exploring integration as well. So what ION delivers, um, massive scale, right? We can do thousands of PK operations a second, you know, tens of billions operations annually. We can support the entire globe if we needed to, just on ION. 
um, cost efficiency, you know, even at people ask, well, you know, what about the fees? And I say, you know, even at hundred dollars per Bitcoin transaction, we can do a, an, a PKI operation for as little as one cent an op. So what an operation is, is like, they're very infrequent. It's like, if you were to get a new phone, you need to rotate to an, from a new old phone to a new phone, you need to associate the key with your ID. Um, so that's, you know, one cent pretty cheap, right? They probably charge you more for the, the SIM card um, inside your plan. Decentralization, uh, it's actually decentralized. Uh, unlike some other protocols out there that you might you know, see, there's no like rug pull, smart contract, you know, master key, there's none of that stuff. Ion nodes are lightweight. They can run on Raspberry Pis. They're, they're not bottlenecked on CPU. It doesn't take you a long time to start up a node. Um, it's mostly storage. Um, the system is, is a lot IPFS, a little bit Bitcoin, uh, and, and then some processing logic. So it's an intrinsic utility consumer. Uh, Ion in, consumes the most intrinsic utility of Bitcoin, which is just the actual transaction space. It doesn't need a whole lot. For, for about 100 transactions, we could support the globe with 50 billion DAD ops per year. Um, so what are we using this thing for? Uh, right off the bat, verifiable credentials, and then later on, probably personal data stores. I'll just kind of go into it. Um, oh, the foundation of verifiable credentials is the ability to sign a proof from someone to someone else, right? In this case, we've got Woodgrove, an issuer of an employment credential, for instance, and they're going to sign this credential to their employees. Their employee can go anywhere they want and prove that they are, in fact, an employee of this place. Uh, Ion, in this case, is just used to look up the public keys behind the IDs and do the signing, right? And so it, it's it's really there for that that PKI substrate. Um, another one that we're working on, uh, Dietrich, is you know we talk to a lot of the groups frequently, um, you know groups like Textile and Fission and uh, Ceramic is personal data stores. So when I talked earlier about DIDs can have associated with them routing endpoints, well, to where, right? What, what are those routing endpoints to? We think in the future, it's gonna be these personal data stores. And if you know someone's ID, you can look up their routing endpoint and you can send messages and other, you know, exchange other pieces of data with them. A um, Couple of use cases I'll quickly go over. Hey, like so, so, uh, Signal and Telegram are awesome, right? But wouldn't it be better if we just had, you know, a standard encrypted messaging uh, layer for the web? I think it would be. And that's exactly what DIDs plus personal data stores are. If you know someone's ID, you can encrypt a message by looking up their keys, send them the message uh, to their data store. And now there's a substrate that's common. So you could build apps like Signal and Telegram and others um, on a common infrastructure that's standardized um, where the app itself is mostly just UI and sort of some affordances you build around it but the underlying layer isn't like a per app sort of infrastructure and is much harder to block in places that wanna like suppress communication. Um, another one that we're doing right now is, you know, the ability to go to an ID and fetch some data that proves maybe what it is. Um, so in this case, a school, right? Do you know if it's accredited? Well, if you find the DID of the school and you wanna to go to those endpoints and go to its data store and say, hey, give me this accreditation credential, right? Um, that's one way that we're gonna be using these things right off the bat. And last one I'll go through is, you know, travel plans, right? Like, isn't it amazing how like all your apps have to do this thing where they all store data in silos and then someone has to try and make sense of this. If your data is stored with you in accordance with your DID and your data store, you can grant access to apps and they can sort of work off the same corpus of data so that you can have an app that shows a visualization across all of these different activities, which is a you know, huge benefit to the user. So I don't know if I have a little bit of time, but uh, I was gonna show like an actual live kind of demo here, if you wanted to get involved with Ion as a developer, um, we've got this library that I helped write, which is just a JS library that works in the browser um, and in Node, and um, it essentially gives you a really easy way to create uh, Ion dids, and that's like right here. This is creating an Ion did. You get your first did. You can use it right away. Um, there's some other helper um, methods here, like generating the URI for the did, um, things like signing, like generating key pairs for the various supported key types, um, JWS verification signatures, um, and a few other things. And you can even anchor the IDs and resolve them. Uh, the default is our Microsoft server because we're running a node that resolves and anchors. Um, so we're covering the cost of the Bitcoin anchoring right now, um, and we're doing the resolution. And that's fine. You could put your own endpoint in if you want, like if you run your own ION node, um, but we're just doing this as a help to the community so people can get started as quickly as possible. And just to show you, it's not BS. Um, here's me creating a bunch of ion dids. You can see here we're just running through them. And I might like say, you know, I'm, I'm going to put this 
JWS and test it out. And you know, it's, it's basically generating uh, JWS, it's signing it and then verifying that in fact, the word test was um, signed over by the did that's been created down here. So you have all these capabilities in a library that's very easy to use in the browser. Um, and you know, that's basically, I in a nutshell, we'd love, you know, your support and you know get involved. It's done. It's all done through decentralized identity foundation. So decentralized identity or identity foundation slash ion at the bottom of the screen. Um, there's an install guide there. You can run it bare metal or Docker and the, the links to the JS library.